Growing up, I always loved music. I loved hearing it, singing it, dancing to it. But my real music career began when I was about six years old and I started to take piano lessons, and I still continue to play today. And when I got to high school, I signed up for the vocal music program and I joined my school choir to fulfill my grade nine arts credit. And I'll never forget my first choir rehearsal. I'm pretty sure we were just singing O Canada, but let me tell you, it was phenomenal. I remember walking into the auditorium, seeing all of my classmates milling about, my teacher frantically trying to get the attention of the group. And after a four beat count in and a deep breath, all 100 rowdy students landed together on this magnificent four part chord singing on the vowel O. And it was probably just a standard F major chord, but I still got chills. We were all singing together, different notes moving in harmony to create this rich, full sound. And I had this profound sense that I was part of a greater unit. From that point forward, and through singing in other choirs, I became the music nerd that I am today. Singing in a choir instilled a deep passion for music in me. And I could be cliche and say that I can't imagine my life today without music. But in reality, I can't imagine my life without the sense of community and belonging that I feel when making and sharing music with a group of people, without that magical energy that happens when singers lock into the same headspace and time to create something that's truly beautiful. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today, the social power of music, and more specifically, the ability for music education to cause real social change. And I'm going to start by taking you to Venezuela, where there exists a program called El Sistema. El Sistema is a national, not-for-profit music education program where children as young as three years old come to a center five, six, sometimes seven days a week and receive free music lessons. But what might surprise you about this program is that it's funded by the Venezuelan government as a social program, not an arts program. And just to clarify what I mean by social program, usually when we're talking about social programs, we talk about gang intervention programs or drug intervention programs. El Sistema aims to serve the same purpose, but through the function of music education. The program was founded 38 years ago in Caracas, which is one of the most violent cities in the world. Venezuela as a whole, with a population size of almost 30 million, has a homicide rate of close to 20,000 people each year, and it also exhibits severe socioeconomic disparity. According to the El Sistema funding proposal from 2006, because low-income families tend to have more children, over 70% estimated of Venezuelan children under the age of 15 are living, were living in what were designated as poor households, or barrios, as you can see pictured here, or slums. And these homes may not, have had, may not have any running water or electricity, and the entire family could be living in just two or three rooms. The school dropout rate is also over 20%, and many children become involved in gangs and other criminal activities that, might, that fuel a sort of destructive cycle that's really difficult to break out of. In 1975, a man by the name of Maestro Jose Antonio Abreu wanted to give young musicians the opportunity to play in an, or in an orchestra. So he started a youth orchestra in Caracas for anyone who wanted to play. And as his orchestra began to grow and gain some international recognition, Abreu applied to the Venezuelan government for some funding in order to support the continuation of his orchestra. And as I mentioned earlier, Abreu didn't apply through social funding, but through, or through arts funding, but through social funding. And that's because Abreu believed that arts education catered to an elite class and that all students in the country, all children in the country, should have access to music education. Abreu declared that his orchestra did much more than just teach music, and that giving kids the opportunity to play in an orchestra would take them off the streets as they worked toward creating something of beauty together rather than something destructive. He said that if you put a violin in the hands of a child, that child will not pick up a gun. Funding was granted, and soon youth orchestras began sprouting up all around the country. Abreu called these musical centers nucleos, and these nucleos are connected and funded today through the National Network of Youth and Children's Orchestras of Venezuela, or FESNOYIV, as is its Spanish acronym. And hence, El Sistema, or The System, was born to begin what Abreu referred to as the nationwide fight against poverty. Today, FESNOYIV supports 180 nucleos and over 300 youth orchestras and choirs. 
350,000 children participate in El Sistema, and the program has seen over 2 million pass through since its beginnings. The program is offered to any child in the country, regardless of socioeconomic status, academic ability, or previous music experience, and 60% of the children who participate in the program actually hail from Venezuela's poorest communities. The program is offered completely free of charge, based on the promise that students attend the 17 hours of instruction that's given each week. And that 17 hours is the sum of every day after school that a child could be engaging in some other sort of damaging activity. So the frequency at which these kids rehearse is fairly intense, but having fun is at the heart of the learning process, and that's really what keeps kids wanting to stay in the system. <coughs> So by now you're probably thinking, or at least I hope you're thinking, that this is a really beautiful and inspiring idea. But you're probably also wondering, how does having 350,000 happy musical children really count as social transformation? Can we really consider this a social program? So I'll give you some facts. Statistics show us that compared to students who are not part of the system, El Sistema students have lower dropout rates, higher class performance, Fewer behavior, higher academic performance, fewer behavioral problems, higher youth employment, and most notably, higher community involvement. And all of these factors combined actually return almost twice the amount of money that's invested in the program back into the country. So this is some evidence of some real tangible social impact. But this social impact actually stems from some fairly intangible means. One of the defining features of the program is its teaching method. All instruction is given through group lessons, and the focus is on building an orchestral ensemble rather than developing solo skills. There may be some group sectionals or one-on-one -on -one interaction with a teacher just to check in on a student, but the real focus is to make music as a group. The groups are of mixed age, and there's a heavy emphasis on leadership and peer mentorship. As students develop their skills, they teach one another with this philosophy that even if you know nothing but A, B, and C, you have the power to teach A, B, and C to others, and you yourself will learn by teaching. This interaction builds a stronger sense of community and, oops, uh, community and trust. <laughs> Sorry, this interaction builds a stronger sense of community and trust and minimizes feelings of inhibition or competition, creating a safe environment for students to be themselves and make mistakes. Students begin to realize that they are extremely significant as individuals contributing to the success of the group. And this, on the one hand, inspires teamwork and cooperation, but it also inspires a stronger sense of self-worth. Teachers are constantly looking for, for, for performance opportunities in order to give their students something to work toward. With this added pressure and knowledge, knowing that students are responsible for one another, having this constant performance goal instills discipline in the students. And what's more, as students perform for their families and their community members, they take pride in what they're doing. And their parents are in turn proud of the children. And in this way, the benefits of the program begin to ripple out into the greater community. So having older students mentor the younger, having alumni return as teachers, by watching other youth orchestras and professional orchestras play, this all shows children in the system that they too have the potential to be just as great, and children feel empowered that they can do anything that they work toward in their life. Some students do go on to become professional musicians, and some have even achieved the status of world class. You might recognize this man because of his curly hairdo. This is Gustavo Dudamel, and he is the young, vivacious conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and he's also a product of the system. But whether or not students in the system choose to pursue music professionally, all of the intangible benefits of the El Sistema program give kids opportunity. And this opportunity arises from what they, how they have developed personally and what they have been able to do in the program. And that, to me, is what is most beautiful and inspiring about this program. So I think it was 2008, I think I was in grade 11, um, but I was watching 60 Minutes with my parents, as we tend to do on Sunday nights, and I saw for the first time the Simone Bolivar National Youth Orchestra. And this is sort of the highest tier youth orchestra in Venezuela, in a, for, that's part of El Sistema. And they were playing Mambo from the West Side Story Suite. And they were playing with a vibrancy and a passion that I'd never really seen or heard before, but still with the precision and caliber of a world-class orchestra. 
And what really stood out for me, aside from the music itself, were their exuberant faces and these sort of high energy dance moves and flourishes that they do with their instruments, as you can see pictured here. Their energy is contagious, and it's almost impossible not to fall in love with this orchestra, especially after you hear their story. But I'm not the only person who's been inspired by this idea. 25 countries around the world have replicated the El Sistema model in their own communities. Here in Canada, we have at least nine programs that explicitly link themselves with the El Sistema model, and there are certainly more, develop more developing. I should mention Sistema Saskatoon, which is also our newest program here in Canada, and they're not on the list today. So this is really exciting. And maybe I was living under a rock, but more likely I was stuck in my Toronto bubble because that's where I'm from. But I didn't know that Canada had any Sistema-inspired programs until last year when I heard about Sistema Toronto, and I was so excited to hear that Canada had caught on. But after this initial excitement wore off a little bit, I had to take a step back and I thought to myself, you know, this is really great, but Canada is a very different place from Venezuela. With a comparable population size, our homicide rate is 600 people per year, compared to the 20,000 in Venezuela. And 8% of our children are living in low-income households, compared to the estimated 70% in Venezuela in 2006. And geographically, we're far more vast, and our, we, our population speaks over 200 languages, and we have this huge diversity of cultural backgrounds. And what's more, we have enough trouble funding our arts programs in our school system. So could this really work here? Do we have the same social needs as Venezuela? I was learning about Sistema this and Sistema that, and I couldn't help but wonder if maybe we were just jumping on the old Sistema bandwagon. So I took some time to look into this question on my own. What does the El Sistema model for music education look like in Canada? So of the nine programs that I've listed here, no two programs are identical. Most, some of this difference stems from the amount of resources that are available to the programs, but most of the difference comes from the different communities that the programs are located in and catering to. Some programs like Sistema Toronto, for example, serve a specific neighborhood, and in that case it's Parkdale in Toronto, while other, other programs serve a broader demographic. Here in Hamilton, an instrument for every child is closely linked with the school board. In Ottawa, the Leading Note Foundation is affiliated with the universities of Ottawa and Carleton for research purposes and also for some student mentorship by students in the university students in the music programs there. Some programs offer band, some strings, most offer some sort of choir. And only one program in Canada receives any government funding at the moment, and that's Sistema New Brunswick, which is our only provincial program, and it's affiliated with the New Brunswick Youth Orchestra, and they have received over $1 million in provincial funding to date. The rest of the programs rely exclusively on sponsorship, and this really determines the types of programs they can offer, the facilities they can use, and how many teachers they can have. So funding has been a major obstacle in implementing programs here in Canada, but our programs have still been remarkably successful, at least in maintaining that they're offering free music education to children who otherwise wouldn't have access. And on top of all the other benefits of the program, this in and of itself is hugely beneficial for Canadian families, as it enables them to avoid paying for childcare services most days after school, saving them hundreds of dollars each month. Oops. So though our programs are independent of one another, they all share the same core values and features, and that's group lessons, peer mentorship, inclusion. Uh, peer mentorship and inclusion. And they give kids an opportunity on a daily basis to engage and have fun and be themselves through music making. And this is when I start to realize that El Sistema is not so much a tangible, structured program that we can transplant from Venezuela into Canada as much as it is a philosophy. And the key to the success of these programs in Canada is the adaptability of this philosophy. We don't have to ma match El Sistema Venezuela to a T in order to function just as well. Adaptability of this philosophy to our communities and to the resources available to us is what enables this idea of social change through music education to thrive in new contexts. Making mistakes, learning from them, moving forward, adapting, this idea of learning from one another and inspiring others is deeply ingrained in the El Sistema philosophy and plays a huge role in the adaptability of the program. 
In 2009, Maestro Abreu won the TED Prize, and the TED Prize is an award offered by the TED organization, and it's a monetary prize for somebody who has an idea that will hopefully benefit the global community. And what Abreu did with his prize is he founded a fellowship organization where professional musicians from around the world could come to Venezuela and work in the nucleos and share their skills in exchange for learning about the program and taking those ideas back to their own communities. Here in Canada, we've been excellent about deepening our understanding of how to adapt this philosophy to our communities. We've had four symposiums to date where music educators across the country have come together to discuss the picture of El Sistema in Canada, what works and what doesn't, in order to improve our programs here. And there has even been discussion about the potential for having our own system, our own national system for funding and, and communication purposes. And this exchange of information, this interaction, this dialogue is all really integral to the improvement of our programs here and the adaptability of the program here. But really, what does the El Sistema model for music education look like in Canada? In the spring of last year, I went down to Sistema Toronto to see what they were up to. And I was really surprised by what I saw there. I walked into a classroom of maybe 15 or 20 students, and they were all between the ages of 6 and 12. And they were clearly from a multitude of diverse cultural backgrounds. And they were a strings ensemble, so they were holding violins and violas and cellos and basses. And the director motioned for the ready position and the students responded appropriately, and they watched him intently for the downbeat, and then they broke out into Vivaldi's Spring. And it was, of course, a modified version of Vivaldi's Spring, but each instrument still had its own part, and they really sounded like a little orchestra. And what impressed me the most was how well the kids responded with both body language and, and volume to express the emotions of the piece, and these are just you know, six, seven, eight-year-old kids. And with every passing minute, the kids became more and more energized with every new piece, with every musical epiphany moment, with every joke from their equally energetic and incredibly devoted teachers without whom the program really couldn't function. And at the end of the day, I got to watch a little girl bounce out of the room with glee because she was given permission for the first time to take her instrument home for the weekend to practice. It's clear that these kids love what they do and that they're proud of themselves. So, what does the El Sistema model for music education look like in Canada? Well, I haven't been to Venezuela to observe a session there, but I have a feeling that it isn't very different from what I saw in Toronto. Kids making music with their peers, having fun as part of a group, and no matter how well they play, they're benefiting in some way, be it intellectually, emotionally, or socially. In Canada, we may not have economic poverty that's as extreme or widespread as we might see in Venezuela. But social exclusion still exists here, and socioeconomic disparity still exists here. And though most of our children might have access to clean drinking water, and the majority might stay in school until they're at least 16, doesn't mean that we don't still have kids who lack hope, or who have low self-esteem, or who struggle academically, or who feel that they don't belong in their communities, be they from a low-income neighborhood or a place of economic privilege. Those problems are universal, and that's why the program is so valuable here. It's amazing to me how something as simple as music can cause such widespread social impact, but at the same time, it makes sense. Many social programs intervene in order to target a specific problem. Music education works from within, equipping students from a very young age with a strong sense of community, feelings of self-worth, and hope, and this all helps them to transcend obstacles in their lives, be they physical or emotional. Music education does not cause social change. In the case of these programs, children cause social change. Music education just gives them the foundations to do so. Thank you.